I'm not sure that I know of a job or of a work that is more stressful to do than moving everything out of a house to transport it and put it in another one. Because if you've ever been a part of that, if you've ever done it yourself, if you've ever helped someone else do it, you find that as you begin to work on it, you empty a room out, you walk back into it to say, okay, what can I clean up? And things have miraculously popped back up in there. There's more things to move. It's the never-ending job. And especially when it's on quite a journey, when you have to go a long way, there's the inevitable uh, questions that come from whoever's with you. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Please stop asking, are we there yet? And it just keeps coming. And so there's, there's a lot of difficulty that comes with that sort of thing. And so this morning, as we continue our series in Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to talk about Abraham. By faith, he moved. By faith, he did something that was really hard. And, you know, we think about how difficult it is by today's standards. He didn't have a GPS. He didn't, as was just read for us, even have the location. By faith, Abraham moved. He took on something that was difficult. God told Abram, I want you to move. I want you to go on a long journey. And what we see, and we're going to begin this morning, that Abram, uh, Abraham left his old life behind, and we're going to start off in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where that command was given to begin with. And we're going to talk about some of what Abraham had to leave behind in his old life as God told him, I want you to move. I want you to go somewhere else. And so in Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. I will bless the one who blesses you and curse the one who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And so in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, we see what that entailed. and Also a little bit of the beginning of verse 4. But there's a number of things he said I want you to leave behind. He said, I want you to leave behind your country. Have you ever traveled internationally? Think about all of that entails. The way, that, the way of life is different. I remember whenever I first moved to Scotland, it took me, and in going into the grocery store again and again and again, it took me weeks to figure out where the grape juice was kept. Even though I was hunting for it, it was on my list every week because they didn't package it the same. They didn't keep it in the same area. It wasn't, at least in my mind, it wasn't where it made any sense. Leave your country behind. There's all kinds of complications that go along with that. Leave your country behind because there's the cultural differences. You leave behind your way of life. You leave behind your customs. You leave behind the way that people talk and the way that people do things and you expect things to be a certain way and you go to another country and they just aren't. Leave your country. Leave your relatives. Leave your family connections, everybody that you know. Leave the people that you grew up with. Leave the people that you're familiar with. Leave your way of life behind. Leave your father's house, those who are the closest to you, those who know you the best, those that you're comfortable with and familiar with. Leave them behind. The people that you're going to miss more than anyone else, leave them behind. And in Abraham's case, possibly to never see some of them ever again. Leave your father's house. And so he's telling him to do all of these things that would be really difficult. And then he says, to the land that I'll show you. Get on the road. I'll tell you where you're going once you're on the way. As was read for us just a few minutes ago in Hebrews chapter 11, it said that he went out not knowing where he was going. So when Abraham set off, he didn't know where he was going. So, you know, you get on this long road trip, and we're familiar with it. we got the GPS. Are we there yet? Well, not yet. How much longer? And you can look down. It'll be three hours and 17 minutes exactly. We have this, how, this far to go, and it tells you. But when Abraham is asked, are we there yet, by those traveling with him, well, he doesn't know because he doesn't even know where there is. He took on a big task. The Hebrew writer says, by faith. What does faith look like? It means doing what God said even when you don't understand what this is going to look like entirely. Now, 
this is the first of, as we work our way through Hebrews 11, this is the first of two sermons where we're going to look at Abraham. Because this week we're seeing how Abraham moved. Next week we're going to talk about how Abraham sacrificed. But if we're really being honest, this was also a sacrifice. When Abraham was told, take your only son, the son whom you love, take Isaac and offering a burnt, offer him as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. That wasn't the first time Abraham was told to sacrifice something important. He had to sacrifice here his lifestyle, sacrifice his family connections, sacrifice his relationships, sacrifice a lot of his ways of doing life in order to move. We just, when we look at the section we will next week, we're going to see where God asking Abraham to sacrifice has taken a, a big step up. But it's not the first thing that God has asked Abraham to sacrifice for his faith. And this would have been something of a risk for Abram. He had no evidence of the fulfillment of the promises that God made. I want you to leave everything behind. I want you to go out somewhere and I want you to start over. And I'm going to wait till you're on the road before I tell you where you're going, Abraham. There's a risk. There's no evidence. Just like when Noah began to build that ark that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, there's no evidence that there was going to be a flood. Noah might could ask, what's a flood? The unseen element, we talk about faith, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The unseen evidence here is the land. It is the place that he's being sent. He didn't have any evidence. He didn't see it, but he took God at his word. He trusted that God was going to come through. And so he was willing to sacrifice everything. He was willing to put his whole life at stake for the sake of doing what God said. But, you know, you look here and it says, leave your country, leave your relatives, leave your father's house to a land I'll show you and I'll make you a great nation. The temptation there would be, well, Lord, why can't you make me a great nation right where I'm at? After all, wouldn't it work a little bit better if I stayed here with my family? There's more of us. Get a little bit better start on this nation thing. Why can't I do it right here, Lord? Turn with me, if you will, to Joshua chapter 24. And I think we see at least one of the reasons why God called Abraham to leave where he was. In Joshua 24, and this is <coughs> after the Israelites lights have entered the promised land and Joshua is getting ready to give them a choice. You got to choose how you're going to live and we're familiar with where he says you got to choose who you're going to serve. In verses 1 through 3, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for the heads and their judges and officers and he presented them they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham. Okay, now we're getting back to that family. Why was Abraham called out? Terah, the father of Abraham. And the father of Nahor. And they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. They served other gods. Why would God say, I want you to cut ties? Why would God say, I want you to move to a different place? I want you to leave all of that behind. I want you to leave your lifestyle behind. Is because the, the concept of idolatry and polytheism was ingrained within them. They served other gods. And one of the things that God was getting ready to do as He started this new nation from Abraham, as He's getting ready to, <coughs> to start the nation of Israel, is He wants them to be a God that, or, or a nation that serves only one God, that serves the one true God, not these many gods. Now, we know that they struggled with that concept for some time as it was ingrained within them. They struggled with that for their entire history. But one of the things that God tries to do is to pull us away from uh, the sin of our past. God took Abraham and turned him into a nation and showed himself uh, to all of them that he is the one true God. He had to leave behind what would have stood between him and his descendants serving the one true God exclusively. Because God is not willing to share the throne. 
And Abram was told, leave that behind. Because you know, we tend to be like the people that we spend time around. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20, we see this truth come out. Similar to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, where he said, Do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. In Proverbs 13, 20, we read, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Why? Because we tend to imitate the character and the behavior of the people that we spend the most time around. If we're around people who are doing foolish things, sooner or later we're going to get involved in doing something foolish. You want to be wise... Find someone wise to be around. Find a group of wise people that will help you to grow and help you to become what you want to be. (coughs) We tend to be like those people that we're around. Abraham, I want you to leave your family behind. Why? They served other gods. Abraham had to leave his old life behind. But in this text... In Hebrews, we also see what Abraham was seeking in the midst of this. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11 in the text that was read for us just a moment ago. And we're going to read a little bit further on in that section. In Hebrews chapter 11, notice in verse 10 specifically, it says, For he was looking for the city which has foundation, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, come on down a little further, and this is further than what was read for us a moment ago in verse 13. It says, All these died in faith, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of the country from which they had went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Seeking something better. Abraham was seeking something that was beyond just a physical inheritance. He was seeking a city whose architect and builder is God. He was trusting in the promise of God that something better awaited him than what he left behind. As hard as it is to leave things behind, Abraham said, I trust that God has something superior. I trust that God can do more with me if I will follow His instructions and go where He's sending me. Because He was seeking something greater than what the world has to offer, He was made into a great nation. In Genesis 22, 18, He said, In your seed, God told Abraham, In your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Because Abraham was seeking what God had to offer, because he was seeking something more than this physical place, because he was seeking more than the here and now, God blessed him. He was blessed because of his obedience. He obeyed because he trusted God fully. And in this text that we're looking at in Hebrews 11, it talks about how they didn't seek to go back. Those who are faith, they didn't seek to go back from where they had come. Abraham never sought to return where he came from. But throughout his life, he continued to trust in God and to live at His Word. God is looking for people who aren't looking to go back to where they came from. We have a new life in Christ. The old self has died. The old self is gone. We are a new creation in Christ. God is looking for people who will be totally committed to that new way. Without seeking to go back. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, Jesus speaks of this concept. When he has people who want to follow him and they're saying, well, let me go do this first. Let me go take care of that over here first. And he says, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, people of the kingdom are people who are totally committed. They're not looking back at their previous lifestyle with a view to returning to it. I don't want to go back to that sin. I don't want to go back to that old way because what God offers is exponentially better. What He offers can't be compared with what came before. God wants a total commitment from His people. Not just a, well, I'll be around and, well, unless something better comes along. Which there is nothing better. But He doesn't want people who are constantly looking for something else. He wants a people who are totally committed. 
Then our text in Hebrews 11 and verse 12. Abraham trusted God to make him into a nation. It says, therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, as many descendants as the stars of the heaven in number, and as innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. You remember in whenever God took Abraham outside and he said, I want you to count the stars if you're able to. He said, that's how many descendants you're going to have, Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham trusted that God would make him a nation. Even though the book of Romans says he contemplated his own body. He contemplated Sarah's womb. He contemplated the physical situation that there was no way on earth that by their own power this couple was going to have a kid. But he did not waver in unbelief. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He put his trust completely in God. Abraham trusted that God would make him a nation if he moved. He believed that God would fulfill his promises if, if he moved. Why go back to the old life? There's nothing there anymore. Abraham was seeking something better. But it brings to mind a question that all of us have to ask. What are you seeking? What am I seeking? Where's the focus? Just a few minutes ago, Gene led us in the song, This World is Not My Home. But you know, sometimes we like to cozy up to it a little bit. Our biggest goal sometimes is financial achievement, career advancement. How much fun can I have? We, we tend to feel very at home in this world. We have to be careful of that. This is not where we ultimately belong. Paul speaks to that. If you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read a, it's a little bit longer of a section there. And we see Paul's outlook. As he's talking in Philippians to a church that's dealing with some division, dealing with an, an issue of disunity, and in chapter 3, one of the things you see coming out is he's calling them to, to refocus on what's really eternally important. Refocus on what really matters. Not these petty issues that they were, they were having fights over, but refocus on what really matters for eternity. And he says in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 7, For whatever things were gained to me, what was gained to Paul? Maybe his prominence in Judaism? The influence that he had to have people that would travel with him on his, uh, on his journeys to go and fulfill his missions of trying to get rid of the church. What was gained to Paul? Maybe the financial ability that he had to be able to, to fund such trips. What was gained to Paul? Well, he talks about his lineage. The fact in the earlier verses he talked about as of righteousness in the law, blameless. What was gained to Paul? The connections that he had, because he had letters from the chief priests. He had connections with those who were higher up. He says, whatever was gained to me, and there was a lot there. Those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, all of those things that the world counts as something special, he says, that doesn't count nearly as much as a relationship with Jesus. Being in Christ. It means more to know Christ than anything else this world can offer. And Paul knew it because he had a lot by the world's standards. And he says, I count that loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, there's why it's so much better. Is because righteousness doesn't come from law. Righteousness doesn't come from how good we can be. Because we can't earn it. Righteousness comes from God on the basis of trusting Him. That I may know Him, he says in verse 10, in the power of His resurrection, in the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now notice verse 12 and, and following. Not that I've already obtained it, 
or have already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I was, uh, which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind of his past sins that he may feel guilty of. Forgetting what lies behind of his past accomplishments that he may boast in. He says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on to the goal. That goal of being with God. That goal of being in His presence. That goal that can only be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He says, I've forgotten all of those things that don't matter anymore. And notice if you go on down to verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. I'm pressing on towards the goal of getting to where my citizenship is. Of getting to be with my Lord. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. This world is not my home. What, will it, what does it profit to gain the whole world and lose your soul? In Matthew 6, Jesus speaks to this concept in the Sermon on the Mount. Where he draws a contrast between what the people of this world who have a physical focus, what they tend to, to be fixated on, and what the focus of a person of the kingdom, a child of God, is to be. In Matthew 6, beginning in verse 31, he says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? That sounds a lot like our world today in the news media. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? What's the economy going to be like? Who's going to get elected? What's the nation going to be like in the next few years? What direction are we going? Don't worry about these things, he says. The physical, the here and now, the things that we get so worked up in. The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. God knows what you need, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We shouldn't fixate our attention on these things. Now, that's not to say that we need to be foolish and not make plans to be, you know, to be wise in how we handle ourselves here, but that's not where our focus is. That's not what we're fixated on. That's not the priority, because when we trust God, we put him first, we do what he tells us to first. He's promised to take care of us. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. Psalm 37, 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Our God takes care of his people. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But the question that we have to ask yet again is, what am I seeking? What am I after? Where is my focus? You know, we tend to... If you're anything like me, a lot of times we get distracted and we get focused on things. We don't make decisions based on the right criteria. But if you pay attention to the way that things have gone whenever, if you look back at your life and you find a time whenever you made a decision based on, I want to do what God wants me to do, and I'm going to do everything I can to make that decision, what you'll inevitably find is that that was probably one of the best decisions you ever made. And you'll see that it, played, that it paid rich dividends again and again and again. And while, you know, speaking for you know, myself personally, I've made plenty of blunders in making decisions. But I'll tell you one time, I'll give you an example whenever I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to do this how God wants me to do it. It was when I first got a call from Ken Wilson. And he said, we'd like to talk to you at the Puyallup Church of Christ. But it scared me to death. Because I'd never been anywhere within probably 1,500 to 2,000 miles of here. And I began to pray about it. And there were all of these obstacles that seemed to be in the way. Oh, no, 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 that can't happen because of this and this and this and this. And I remembered taking some time 
that evening after that first phone call and I said, Lord, I want you to I want to be where you want me to be. And within the next probably 48 to 72 hours, every one of those obstacles dissolved. And I can still look back on that after three years and say I'm so thankful because it's one of the best decisions that Pam and I ever made. And we're, we're so thankful to be here. When we make decisions with God in mind, it always works out best. And so it comes to the question, comes down to the question again of what are we seeking? As we tend to find what we're looking for. It's amazing how that works. If we seek after the things of this world, we'll find it. But when we seek God, we'll find Him. Ask, seek, knock. We see there in Matthew 7, seek and you will find. When we seek after Him, he will be found seeking what God offers, though it requires that we leave something behind. Abraham had to leave behind his family, had to leave behind his country, had to leave behind everything that was familiar and comfortable to him. And because of it, God made him a nation. God promises us a place in his presence, an inheritance in heaven. But we have to leave behind our old life. We have to leave behind sin and immorality. We have to leave behind our old priorities. We have to leave behind what we've been seeking for in other instances. And we have to put Him first. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Our old focus, our old fixation, our old way of thinking, our old self has to die. What we seek has to change. Because in Christ we are to be a new creation, a new creature which means new priorities. And so it comes down to the question of what direction are we going? What are you seeking? Abraham was seeking something better than what he had. He was seeking what God could offer him, the fulfillment of God's promises, and he trusted him completely. And so that moved him to go out not knowing where he was going. It moved him to make some hard decisions. And God made a nation of him. We look at Abraham as the father of the faithful. When we choose to seek him, we have a promise of eternal life. We have hope. We have something that's greater than we could ever imagine. And we get the approval of God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 2 speaks about those who live by faith as gaining God's approval. But we have to be willing to seek him first. And sometimes make some really scary moves by faith. We have to take God and live, take God at His word and live at His word. And we have to be willing to make changes, sometimes little, sometimes big. And maybe sometimes without even knowing all the results or what it would be like. But God is looking for people who are willing to risk everything for Him because they trust Him. Do you trust Him? We're going to sing an invitation song in just a moment. Maybe you're ready to take a step of faith. Maybe if as a Christian you found that you haven't been fully trusting in Him and you're ready to take another step in faith to live as He's called you to, we'd be glad to pray for you and encourage you in that. Or maybe this morning you've never obeyed the gospel. You have the opportunity to take that first step in faith and putting Christ on in baptism, demonstrating that you trust Him to forgive you, that you trust Him to save you, when you choose to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. You have the opportunity this morning, and if we can assist you in some way, we'd invite you to come right now while we stand and while we sing.